So let me start by just a little bit of history. I mean, we started this journey probably around five years ago. I think that I attended the first meeting in Duke a few years ago. And it's been taking a while to try to come out with the guidelines and try to come out with like ideas of what actually patients with leukodystrophy actually really need from the respiratory perspective. So this is very interesting data from a survey that was sent in 2017 by Hunter's Hope, um, asking uh, caregivers of patients with leukodystrophy, what are the most important aspects that they want to see from the respiratory standpoint? I mean, the survey had so many um, areas that I just tried to put together different um, relevant topics from the respiratory standpoint. As you can see, aspiration is a very important topic, respiratory infections, if they need respiratory support, they were having issues with airway clearance, with cough. Uh, there was a significant impact in drooling, a significant impact about swallowing dysfunction and so on. So during our first meeting, we uh, actually had parents in the advisory board that they expressed the concerns that what they wanted to see again from the parental perspective, what was lacking in the care of patients with leukodystrophy from the respiratory standpoint. And we focused on a few topics. One was drooling, the first one, airway clearance, uh, respiratory sleep problems, and also um, respiratory insufficiency and the role of ventilatory support, uh, soloing dysfunction and gast gastroesophageal reflux disease. So as Sally mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, we finally have one of the papers published about addressing uh, the first uh, four or five topics. And we let out the swallowing dysfunction and the gastroesophageal reflux for um, a different paper. So I'm gonna focus mainly on the first uh, topics. So let's talk about like drooling. Um, it's one of the most common problems um, it's very difficult to assess drooling, despite that there are many, many scales or many tools that you can use in clinical practice to assess how bad it is. And it's important to assess this to figure out if you actually need to treat it or not. So often in clinic, you will come and somebody will say, yes, my kid is drooling a lot, but the lot could mean maybe you're suctioning once a day, or you might be suctioning 20 times a day, or you might be suctioning every 10 minutes. So there are different scales. I'm just showing you some of them. Uh, the most common one that is using many papers is the teacher's modify scale. And again, as you can see, it can, be, it can go from like dry, there is never drilling, all the way to profuse clothing, hats, x-rays, uh, frequent suctioning. Um, in clinic, we use, we call it like the VIP sign. If somebody comes with a VIP, how often are you changing that VIP? Are you changing it like two or three times per day? Or actually, the parent comes to clinic with like a bag just full of VIPs that they're changing every 10 minutes. Um, there, as I say, like different scales. It depends also on the frequency. It depends on the quantity. And this is very important to assess, are you going to treat or not? Um, so I'm sure you've seen some of patients with significant drooling, how that can affect the skin. So the skin can get macerated. It can get very red and eventually can lead to infections. Um, you need to talk about aspiration. That's one of the biggest concerns. Is my kid aspirating or not? I think that is very important that we make a difference between acute aspiration. So it's somebody that either has a seizure and vomits, and there is a significant amount of the contents of the stomach going into the airway. So that will be more like an acute care issue versus a kid that actually is aspirating from saliva that often happens. Um, you also need to check about are they having any respiratory problems? So you have a kid that maybe has significant drooling, but that's not affecting their quality of life. The parents are okay with a number of like, babes or suctioning, and there are no respiratory concerns, there are no respiratory infections, no pneumonia or anything like that, then the question is, should you treat it or not? Obviously, also, all these patients should be referred to a dentist. You need to check. Remember that saliva plays a significant role on um, like cavities and the humidity of the mouth and so on. Um, so we need to put that balance between drying somebody too much and having consequences um, about having a mouth that is too dry or having like mucus plugs or having very dry secretions that might actually lead to like worse problems that, that um, drooling. Um, just to show you again, what is a salivogram? This is a tool that is not often used. Um, I often see again patients that they have, they've been diagnosed with like aspiration pneumonia so many times. There is 10 times in a year that you look at the records and there is an aspiration pneumonia. When what they might have is just viral infections, especially in kids that are in that age group between two to five years of age, 
They might have a sibling attending to daycare. Uh, so it's very common to have like viral infections and then we just call it aspiration just because they are ruling. So the salivogram is a special test um, just to show you this is a normal salivogram where you see the saliva going um, into the esophagus and into the stomach and you don't see anything else. And these are two abnormal salivograms that you can see the saliva actually going into the airway. So it makes a big difference um, in deciding to treat or not um, the patient. Again, if you have saliva constantly dripping into the airway, that is going to lead to inflammation. The way that your body responds to inflammation is to create more mucus, right? If you have like gastritis or you have something like that, your body starts producing more mucus. So it will increase the amount of mucus production and it will make the drooling even worse. It may be more thick and so on. So it's important to try to figure out if the patient is actually aspirating or not. Um, so this is one of the most common questions that we have uh, in the respiratory clinic and I'm sure in complex care clinics. Um, how do you manage it? So what do you do? So you can start with like non-pharmaceutical -pharma management or no medication, right? This is like common like suctioning. Uh, do they have a suction machine? I think that kids that have significant ruling will benefit from a suction machine at home. Um, how do you do it? Do you do it as needed? There is a schedule. There is no data about the benefits of like a scheduled suction. This is just as needed. Uh, one of the big questions is like, what do you do about like deep suctioning versus just your regular oral, oral suctioning with a young cower? Um, so as you see in the top picture is what we call kind of like a young cower that it will just go to the mouth and you, what you want to suction is something around the cheeks and around the tongue is very safe and it can be very easily done by any provider at home. It can be a parent, it can be a sibling, or it can be a nurse if they have access to uh, nurses or, or uh, any assistance. Uh, it is tricky with deep suctioning. So we've seen patients that they've been thought to do deep suctioning and in generally safe. Um, but the problem is when you go too deep and you must start like triggering the bagel effect. So the heart rate can drop. I've seen kids that they go too deep that they go into the airway or if you touch the vocal cords, it can create a coffee or you can have a laryngus passing with the airway actually closes completely and the kid starts turning blue. So I, I think that you have to be very cautious about deep suctioning. Uh, we usually don't recommend to do deep suctioning unless you have been thought um, by respiratory therapies at the bedside. And you really measure every time that you're going to go in, you measure the distance from the nose to the area that you want to go. If you go, as I say, too deep, as you see in the picture, the vocal cords are right here. Here is the epiglottis. So if you go too deep, you could potentially hit those vocal cords. And if the kid has laryngus passing, um, it can be very, very badly. That's one of the most fear complications that we have when we're doing bronchoscopies in the OR when the airway completely shuts down. So I would be very, very cautious again about recommending um, deep suctioning. Um, so what about medical therapy? Um, there are many, many, many medications out there. There's plenty of literature, especially from um, several pulse of are using medications. There is some data in the leukodystrophy world about using medications. There is not a lot of data. A lot of the data that we actually use in the paper, and we mentioned initially that on the paper, is being extrapolated from other disorders that share a similar physiopathology than leukodystrophies in patients that either have issues with swallowing or weakness of the vulvar muscles or weakness of the respiratory muscles. One of the most common medications is um, glycopyrrolate. It's a pretty safe medication. You can start at a very low dose and within a day or two, you can titrate the dose up. One of the issues with glycopyrrolate is that over time, you will need to increase that dose, not just because of the weight, it's just because the patients become kind of like resistant for a lack of a better word. Um, so you will need to increase the dose. And once you start going to higher doses, you're going to start seeing side effects. Some common side effects are like nausea, constipation. Um, but in kids with significant drooling, especially when they get a cold, the secretions can get very thick. If they get very thick, that can lead actually to atelectasis in the lungs that will lead to hypoxemia. So we often recommend to back off some of the doses during the period of sickness, a respiratory sickness. A scopolamine, a scopolamine patch, I like the scopolamine patch probably better than glycopyrrolate. It's because it's easier for the families. You just put a patch behind the ear and you change it every two or three days. Um, they are not widely available. Sometimes you might need to 
either cut the patch or cover half of the patch, especially in younger kids, because they are not patches that come in smaller doses. You can also use scopolamine via um, enteral G tubes or by mouth. There are other medications, there's sublingual atropine that is being used. Um, the only concern with sublingual atropine, especially in younger kids, is that if you make a mistake with those and you give too much atropine, then it could be a lot of potential problems. Um, so I think that again, like glycopyrrolate, is usually approved by the insurance companies as well as the scopolamine. Once we get to the other medications, it starts becoming a little bit tricky. Now there are surgical approaches too. And we're asked about these like often in clinic. Um, so it gets to the point that you might not be able to use medication because of potential side effects or you max the dose or you already have a key that you have glycopyrrolate and also in a scopolamine patch. They're getting to dry, but they still um, uncontrolled secretions. So there's a couple of like surgical options. I added Botox there, even that is not surgery, just because it's more invasive. Um, so Botox actually works. The only issue with Botox is that depending on the institution, there are some institutions where you can do it at the bedside just with an ultrasound and you just inject the Botox and the salivary to answer. There are other places that you will need an anesthesiologist and sedation and everything. So it depends on the complexities of the system where the patient is being seen. The other issue with Botox is that they might need to have Botox more than once uh, per year. So some kids might need it every three months, some kids might need it every six months. And again, if you think about it, if you're doing it every three months and you need sedation every three months, it's very complex. Um, when it works, it works great. When it doesn't work, then again, every three months or every three months, and it, it tends to be an issue. Um, there are different types of surgeries. Um, so you can have, let me go to the next picture. So there are different type of procedures that can be done. Um, you can, the ENT surgeons, they can either excise the salivary glands, and they can ligate the ducts. They can actually move a duct from one place to another place to try to decrease the amount of saliva that is being produced. Um, there is a new procedure that has been done in a few hospitals. We just started doing that in our hospital in the last few months. It's called a salivary gland um, ablation. This is being done at Nationwide Children's at Baylor, Texas Children's Hospital for a while. But basically what they do is minimally invasive. It's just an ultrasound. You localize the gland and they inject alcohol into the gland. So the gland will shrink and will decrease the amount of saliva. Uh, it, the data that is out there from these two centers is very promising. It seems that it works great. And then you will avoid surgery, which implies a lot of things with anesthesia recovery and so on. So let's talk a little bit about um, airway clearance. As we mentioned, one of the main concerns from the initial survey was like the frequency of pneumonias, kids that are weak, uh, muscle tone and spasticity plays a significant role, especially scoliosis, because it will affect the position of the muscles, especially the diaphragm. And then even that kids can cough, that doesn't mean that that cough is effective. It doesn't mean that it's strong enough to get the mucus out. If you have a cold and you cannot get the mucus out, that will lead again initially to either like an atelectasis or it can lead to a pneumonia. So we highly recommend for every patient that can perform pulmonary function tests that we measure the lung function. Remember that leukodystrophies come in different flavors and colors. There might be patients that they can't perform the maneuvers for, um, to do pulmonary function testing, but there are other patients that may be, they might be able to do it. The most complex one is the spirometry, as you can see right here. But there are other tests that we can do. We can measure the cough strength. So we can put a mask on the face with a manometer to see how strong the cough is. We can measure the strength of the inspiratory muscles and the expiratory muscles. Obviously, all of these requires a higher level of expertise in the center that has a respiratory therapist that knows how to do this test is something that you're not gonna able to find uh, in a pediatrician office. Um, just again, just to walk you through what happens during the call, which I think is very important. Um, remember there's three phases in, in, in coughing. So the first one is when you inflate your lungs completely, you think about what you do when you choke when you cough, you bring your lungs to total lung capacity. So you increase that. If you have a kid that is very weak, has scoliosis uh, or has like 
is very, very spastic or very, very hypotonic, they're not, they're not gonna be able to go all the way to total lung capacity. Then they need the vocal cords will close, that will increase the pressure within the lungs. And then eventually during the expulsive phase, you use your abdominal muscles plus the pressure within the lungs to get the mucus out. So there are some patients that might have issues with vulvar muscles that they might not be able to close vocal cords, but it doesn't matter. In most studies, even that it, patients, especially patients with ALS, even that the vocal cords or patients with tracheostomy where they, the vocal cords are obviously, um, they don't play a significant role. The cough can still be strong. The main issue is again, the weakness of the inspiratory muscles and the weakness of the expiratory muscles. And this is something that again, we can assess even at the bedside. How do you treat it? I'm sure that all of you heard about chest PT, right? It's a term that you just throw out there and everybody's like, okay, what do you want? Chest PT. So I'm gonna walk you through a little bit about chest PT because chest PT is not just like, oh yeah, chest PT for everybody. And there's very different type of chest PT and at the bedside and based on your patient, you should choose which one is gonna benefit your patient. There's a lot of times that their kids come with like five machines they are overwhelmed, that you're already overwhelmed by other things, and then we're putting more stuff that might not work for that kid. Um, so the most common ones are manual chest PT, which again, the most, everybody probably knows what is that, just tapping on the chest. Uh, the chest vest, that is probably what most parents ask when they come for the first visit, everybody wants a chest vest. And then the covacist device. Um, so again, manual chest PT has been used for many years, but it's not just the fact of like tapping the, the chest. You need to know how to do it. Um, there is the tapping in a specific way. It has to be strong. Sometimes we have that little cup. I don't know, you can see in the picture, the precursor that looks like a little cup. Uh, but then you need to have some positional drainage. You need to figure out you're gonna be, if you wanna drain the upper lobes, you wanna drain the lower lobes, you wanna be on the side and so on. And then there are precautions if somebody has G2 feedings, you don't wanna do it right after a feeding because if you put the kid like in the picture right here after a feeding, that kid might vomit. And we'll talk already about swallowing dysfunction and then eventually boom, the kid aspirates and is like, oh, what is going on? Why this kid is having so many pneumonias? Um, so you have to be careful about how we teach or what we recommend to each parent. Um, the chest vest, again, is something that is being extrapolated from cystic fibrosis. Um, is a good device. It helps families. It takes the human factor out of the picture. It's a lot to do chest PT three or four times per day for 15 to 20 minutes. You need to do it for at least 15 to 20 minutes. So once you put the chest vest, you just hook it up, you turn on the chest vest, and then that's it. But there are issues with the chest vest, right? So if you look again from the cystic fibrosis data, if you compare the chest vest with other devices, um, the chest bed is not superior and actually can lead uh, to more hypoxemia or lower numbers of oxygen and is not as effective as other therapies. Um, one of the main concerns that I have when we want to go uh, into the covacies in a minute is that remember that we talk about how the cough works. All of these um, airway clearance therapies, especially the manual chest PT and the chest vest, what they do, they just produce sheer forces within the airways that wanna change the viscosity of the mucus. So instead of having a very thick mucus, then you're gonna have a less viscous mucus that it will be easier to get it out. But if you have a kid that cannot cough or is very weak, the only thing that you're doing is just shaking the mucus inside of the chest and you're gonna leave it there. It might just go down, further down, and the kid might start having microatelectasis. You're not doing that patient a benefit or prescribing a chest vest if you have not assessed how strong that cough is, which will bring us to the cough assist device. So the cough assist device has been in the market for probably around 20 to 30 years. It's a device that it was going to do, you, it can be delivered as you see in the picture, be a mask, this is obviously from the company, be a mask, be a tracheostomy or a mouthpiece. Um, it will deliver a positive pressure. We set up the pressure that we think is the best for that patient. It varies. Usually you will need pressures that are about 40 centimeters of water um, to like inflate the chest. What you wanna see is that chest expands when you're delivered the positive pressure. And then 
the device creates a negative pressure, a vacuum that is very fast. And it will try to get that mucus all the way up so the patient can either cough it up. In kids, they're not gonna cough it up. You, they wanna swallow that mucus and that's okay. It's gonna go to the GI tract or you could potentially suction it from, from the mouth. Um, there are, again, some caveats with the cough assist device in patients that have some degree of vulvar muscle dysfunction or some neurological issues where the vocal cords can close when you're putting the negative pressure. So you have to be careful. The same can happen in kids under one year of age. Just because of the negative pressure, the upper airway could potentially close. So it has to be assessed at the bedside. Our practice is when we order a cough assist device, we always bring every patient to clinic once they have the device. So we walk them through and we evaluate how they do it or how we respond in clinic. Um, again, as I told you initially, everybody throws just like, air, like chest PT, just do chest PT. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna walk you through everything that is on this slide, but just to give you an idea about the complexity of chest PT. There are different things that can be done in patients that can cooperate. You can use a PEP device. We can uh, show them how to breathe, something called the active cycle of breathing, the hop and pop, and so on. So you really need a respiratory therapist at the bedside to teach them and to evaluate each patient to figure out what will be the best type of chest PT that that patient will benefit from. Um, I always bring up this story about the kid. In, when I was in DC, I think that I was very cocky and naive first year attending. And I was evaluating this patient and I said like, you know, you need to do this, 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 and that. And that father sat down, he was very nice. He said, I really appreciate your time. Like I understand what you're telling me, but I'm not going to do anything that you're telling me right now. You have no clue what is to live with a kid like my daughter. I already spend so many hours per day about doing this. So whatever you're doing is gonna add 44, 45 minutes to my day. And I already have to do all of this. So I'm not gonna do it. So we sat down and we say, okay, what is the priority? What can we help with? Um, so I think that again, like from the physician perspective, sometimes we are very quick to just like, oh, you need to do this, 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 and that. You have no clue what you're talking about. Um, so I think that it's very important to look what the parent's main concern is, how you're gonna address that. And again, based on all of this, what will be the best airway clearance therapy for your patient. It's not just about like throwing out the kitchen sink and ordering like two or three devices without thinking what is gonna happen behind doors. All of these devices now can record data. So I often get the data from the device and there are some families that are like, yeah, yeah, I'm using it every day, don't worry. You look at the data, it's not being turned on for like two months, right? So again, it's like that open channel of communication and trying to figure out how you can help the family. What about the sleep? So sleep disorder reading is, I think that is extremely common in patients with lip leukodystrophy, and I don't think that we're screening enough. Um, so you, how do you screen or how do you get to suspect that the patient has a sleep disorder reading? There are basic clinical questions about the quality of sleep. Are they tossing and turning? Are they snoring? If there is noisy breathing or not? Uh, in some kids, you could ask about headaches, changes in mood, et cetera. Obviously, the gold standard is in a sleep study, but access to sleep studies are very tricky. Our center, like we are right now booking like four months in advance. There are other centers that are six months in advance, other centers that are seven or eight months, and it's extremely tricky. On top of that, there might be a kid that comes to the sleep lab and they're like, well, they don't sleep. Right, so you wait for four or five months to get in the sleep study. They hate the area, they hate the smell, and they just don't sleep. So then you wasted the whole night. Um, so as home sleep studies are not approved for the from the pediatric standpoint yet. So there is a lot of technology coming out, but they are not approved for adults. You could potentially start with a home sleep study, um, but if there is not a lot of access to these, you can actually use an overnight oximetry study. Uh, we often order like two nights oximetry studies. So you get the recording of the data. The oximetry study will be very helpful to screen for patients with severe obstructive sleep apnea when you see a significant number of the saturations, but you will miss mild and sometimes moderate sleep apnea. 
Um, why do we care about this? Is because there's plenty of data for many disorders in health, but also in disorders where lack of adequate quality of sleep can affect a lot of things. Seizures, if you have a kid that is having hypoxemic event at nighttime, it might change the seizure threshold. So we have patients that sometimes we just do an oximetry study and they're seizing just at nighttime. And you just figure out that they're like becoming hypoxemic, probably because of sleep apnea, large tonsils. It's not just the tonsils, the tongue, the mouth, some of the medications that they use to treat um, seizures could change the um, oral mucosa and it can lead to tropic sleep apnea. So I think I, I do think that we're not screening this enough. I think there's plenty of patients that they come to clinic when we evaluate them and they're like, has anybody suggested to do a sleep study? It's been 10 years. And they're like, no, I mean, my kid is like snoring. I can hear it from like the other room and nobody has done anything. How do you manage this? Is surgery, adenoids and tonsils, always ENT. I know that is an invasive procedure, but once you do that, it's, it helps. Then there's nothing else that you need to do. Then you have like non-invasive or invasive ventilation. And then we'll talk about a little bit about, about the complications of, of that. Um, masks nowadays, there are many masks in the market. Uh, this is just an example of a few of the masks that we can use in kids. In adults, you have 40 plus different types. They're like pillows, full face, scuba mask, and everything. In kids, you have a few that they will fit a kid under one year of age. And obviously, we have more masks or interfaces for um, older, older patients. So then it gets more complicated. So what do you use? Right? What device? Like patients are traveling. What is going to happen? Are they battery operated or not? Uh, do they only have issues during the sleep or are they like becoming like respiratory insufficient during the day? This is just an example of a few devices that are more in the market right now. And every year, you're going to see more devices. These are the traditional ones, and these are ventilators. Um, all of these three down here are battery operated. None of the ones up, up here are battery operated. So for traveling, vacations, or sometimes if they fall asleep in the car, if they have like a two, three hour drive to see like a specialist and so on. So you should think about which kind of device you're gonna, you're gonna choose. Um, the other question is like, in some progressive disorders and in some type of leukodystrophy, when you think that things are just gonna get worse over time. So what do you do? How long can you use non-invasive ventilation? And that's a very complex question because it depends on the family, the physician expertise, how bad the disease is, are they aspirating or not already? Can they protect their airway or not? Are they using it 20 hours per day or are they using it eight hours per day? Quality of life, like the support, cultural beliefs, religion, and so on. So you just need to sit down and with your patients and try to figure out what the goals of care are. And I think that from the pediatric perspective, I don't think we do a pretty good job at this. Um, as pediatrician, I think that we don't like to talk about what is going to happen. I think that when you're in your 60s, it's probably an easier conversation about, okay, what are your goals of care? But I think that it's very important to talk about this early. It will prevent a lot of conflict with the medical team and the parents. Uh, we have sometimes patients that they end up in the ICU and eventually somebody in the ICU is talking to them like, do you, need, do you want a trach? And they have no clue. Nobody talked to them about the trach. They have no idea what is going on. Just briefly because of time, non-invasive ventilation is very effective, but it has challenges. You can have facial injury. You can have issues with the mask. Uh, if you use it for more than 16 hours per day, the middle part of the face might not grow at the same speed as the rest of the face. So you can have mid-face hypoplasia, but for some parents, it would be very important. Um, it requires cooperation. In some patients, we can do mouthpiece ventilation. <laughs> Excuse me, it's called sip and puff. So there are devices that during the day, if they can collaborate, they could potentially get this. And we have a few patients, uh, no leukodystrophies, but other neuromuscular disorders that is quite effective. Um, in Buffalo, actually, we have this negative pressure ventilator that basically is kind of like a vacuum that goes on the chest. You can use it at home. The only concern is that it's not battery operated and it tends to be a little bit noisy, but it's something that it could be considered for patients that do not have like a chest deformity. And instead of having something on your face, you have something around the chest, as you can see the kid in the picture. Um, there's always 
like the tracheostomy and ventilation is always an option, but it's something that you have to discuss with the family. You need to figure out if that's something that they want to go through it. Um, again, it takes a village. I think this is one of the pictures that we had um, in the past. There's a lot of people that work on this. Uh, I just want to always acknowledge uh, Hunter's Hope for all of the support. Um, I think that Chad and Lisa moved to Michigan, if I believe they are not around, but uh, they start working with us in the first couple of meetings. And they were great and trying to make sure that we were focusing on the concerns that they have, not what we thought that they needed. Again, Anna, she's always sending me email, like keeping on my toes, and Jackie, uh, I special thanks to both of them. Um, and this is just, again, the initial respiratory group. And this is just from the papers that, that was recently published. 